Hi everyone and welcome to Football Syrupus for our third episode on cognitive biases associated with analysis because this time I'd like to warn you about the conclusions you may be tempted to draw when looking at so-called advanced statistics by first showing you with concrete examples that these advanced data should not be seen as being more than what they allow which is saving time by giving a list of players or game situations to watch. First of all, to draw up such a list, I'd personally only choose the advanced statistics that are displayed on the screen and you'll notice that the vast majority are ratios, particularly with percentages, because for example knowing how many progressive passes a player actually receives without knowing what number to expect for his position in the team would be meaningless, since it's depending on the way the team and its opponents play, that more or less opportunities to receive these forward passes will emerge, so you always have to try to integrate this context, even if it's unfortunately not always possible. For example, uh, I would find it interesting to analyze a goalkeeper who has a high number of intercepted crosses, especially if he plays in a team that concedes few, but I don't think that including the number of crosses from opponents necessarily makes sense, since it's only a certain type of crosses that can be intercepted by the goalkeeper, because only a few arrive around these areas, so the ratio wouldn't be necessarily representative. But having a high number of intercepted crosses doesn't mean that the goalkeeper in question is good at it either, since this number only takes on value once we see how difficult it was to intercept the cross in question. The goalkeeper with the highest ranking on this statistic may simply have been lucky enough to receive a lot of missed crosses that came straight to him, while there are no statistics to quantify the number of bad outings, which would completely change our preconceived ideas in the case of a goalkeeper who would be at the top of the ranking on these two values. Aaron Levenstein's famous phrase comparing statistics to bikinis because they both side was essential takes on its full meaning here, since what they suggest is by no means a truth, but only a certain probability of matching. All this explains why it's the stats with a percentage of success that are more interesting, we found them above all in the duals category, but they are not immune to this phenomenon. One only needs to listen to Virgil van Dijk and watch the following scene to question his face in these metrics. In this sequence, Van Dyke did what he said, which is to make the header as difficult as possible for his opponent by coming up against him so that the latter couldn't turn with his whole body to send the ball rightly behind. An early rebound against Van Dyke right afterwards made it impossible for the ball to come where the Everton player wanted, but the Dutchman still didn't win the duel because he wasn't the first to touch the ball. To increase his chances of winning the aerial duel, Van Dijk could have positioned himself next to his opponent at the start, but that would have been a poor choice given that covering depth is a priority. So it's in fact perfectly acceptable to statistically lose such an aerial duel where the ball arrives even in front of the striker, who therefore has to drop back. All this to say, we mustn't allow ourselves to be trapped by the result bias, which is a very widespread cognitive bias in football, where despite the fact that it's a low scoring sport where it can very quickly tip in favor of one team or the other, many judge according to the result and not according to the probability that the events of the game will lead to it. In the case of analysis and recruitment, this phenomenon often arises because of another bias, that of the GOAT trick whereby statistical data is considered to be superior to everything else because it doesn't come from an emotional being, so that no opinion would achieve such neutrality. But if reality is more complex than what the numbers imply, then the ideal would be to be able to understand the details of the game and its decisions in order to draw the best conclusions from our analysis, which may also revolve around points that the data invites us to look at. The problem is that as human beings, our brain is full of cognitive biases that lead us to erroneous views of reality, in this case the idea we have of a player's or team's abilities. The good news is that knowing about these cognitive biases surely allows us to fall less often into the trap, which is why I wanted to share some of them with you again in this video, using examples from the world of player recruitment. In the first place, a transfer that ends up being disappointing over time can be illustrated by the Peter Principle, which states that many good players will climb up until they reach a league where they will no longer perform. And these bad performances may indirectly be the result of poor adaptation to pressure or uh, come from off-the-pitch reasons. Here we're going to assume that there has been a casting error with regard to the level of the recruit, since two biases can explain this phenomenon. 
The first one is the recency bias, which can lead us to be charmed by a player's last few games when he wasn't nearly as good during the season and so because of these few games, which are the ones we still have in our heads since they were relatively recent, we are going to sign this player. But on at the club, the thing is the latter doesn't perform as expected, which is a quite recurrent pattern in post-national team tournaments transfers, with some players sublimating themselves during the competition because playing for the country brings out something extra in them. But it is also possible that these casting errors uh, occur because of the scouting process within the recruitment department, or there may be a lack of consciousness around the anchoring bias. If a scout gives his opinion about a player to his colleague before the latter goes and observes him, it will be very difficult for the latter to get rid of this first idea that he has of the player, hence the anchoring, even if the performance that he is going to watch doesn't really go in the same direction. In this way, the advantage of asking several scouts for their analysis of a player can be reduced if we tell them hours beforehand. And this incurring bias can also lead to another type of casting error, that of profiling errors. Nothing better illustrates such transfers than Rafael Benitez's reaction to the arrival of Canobio when at Valencia, suggesting that he wanted to strengthen his midfield with qualities other than those of the Uruguayan. But even when discovering a player without any prior opinion, this anchoring bias can exist with first encounters leaving their mark and preventing us from qualifying our opinion, even if the player's subsequent performances bear little resemblance to the first one observed. If it's a specific decision that makes an impression on us, whether it's an excellent one or a very bad one, it might be easier to limit the extent to which it's anchored, because it would be a mistake to lump all decisions together. And I'm not even talking about fundamentally different game situations like being more into defending or attacking here, but of the fact that one is going to use more one system of thinking rather than another depending on the situation. That's what psychologists Olivier Oudé and Daniel Kahneman have observed before developing similar models on the topic. Their conclusion? That what lies behind our decisions differs according to the context, depending on whether a decision is needed immediately or whether we have a certain amount of time and energy to reflect on it. All this explains why there can be a discrepancy in the quality of the choices a player makes if the situation gives them more or less time, which can make us put the encode match sequence in perspective if we know that. Perhaps this is what happened in the Canobio case, with Benitez on the one hand possibly requiring a certain game intelligence, while the scouts were perhaps obsessed with good choices at only one of these extremes, although it's also likely that the club brought him in without considering their coach's wishes, but simply because it was a market opportunity that interested them in the long term. In this case, we could think of the so-called FOMO, the fear of missing out on something that would never come along, but it's a choice that could also have been well thought out, because you have to realize that there are so many cognitive biases that we can imagine some behind every decision, which would precisely be an interesting thing to do on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, to ask ourselves whether the reason behind our feeling is rational or whether a cognitive bias is lurking behind it. In any case, this is what I invite you to do, uh, just as I invite you to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss my next videos. Thank you for watching and see you soon.